Yes. Uh, I'm there now, is that correct? <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. No, thank you for the invitation. I'm looking forward to, to, to talking to you and your your um your your um viewers. Well, th thank you. Now you have we're, we're gonna talk tonight, of course, about the dive. Um, but you've written it quite across quite a breadth of topics. Do you want to talk to us about some of the other books? Sure, sure, books? sure. I've, I've, this is my fifth book um, that's come out, um, and I've written um, a number of other books. I've wrote my first book was um, it was called This Turbulent Priest, which was a biography of the of Cardinal Thomas Winning, who was the leader of the Catholic Church in, in Scotland. Um, but then I went on to and to, to two books about the Second World War. Um, there was Churchill Cigar, which was how. Um, the MI5 effectively protected Winston Churchill during the Second World War from um, from rogue poison cigars, um, and then I also wrote a book called Camp Z, how MI5 um, cracked Hitler's deputy, which was about the the, um, the the very strange story of Rudolf Hess when he arrived in um, in Britain during the Second World War, and the other book that I wrote was um, a book called Fire in the Night which was about the Piper Alpha oil rig disaster, which was the world's worst offshore oil rig uh, disaster back in 1987. Wow. Well, <clears throat> um, we're, we're going to talk about uh, this book at length. And of course, one of the things that we'll also touch on is, is how you chose this subject. Um, all right. Well, good evening. Thanks for joining us. I am Lee Wright, the founder of History Camp. I'm near Boston and with me in Virginia is? Hi, I'm Carrie Lund. I'm the director of The Pursuit of History, the nonprofit that brings these History Camp discussions to you each week. Tonight we have Stephen McGinty with us. Stephen is an award-winning journalist with the London Sunday's Times. He's an author and producer of BAFTA-winning television documentaries. Stephen also won both RTS and BAFTA Scotland Awards for the best single documentary. Dunblane, Our Story, and The Bank That Almost Broke Britain. He is the author of several books, including Fire in the Night, The Piper Alpha Disaster, which he developed into an award-winning documentary, and The Dive, The Untold Story of the World's Deepest Submarine Rescue, which is the topic of our discussion tonight. And Stephen is joining us from his home in Scotland. We want to thank him for that because it's very late there. So thank you so much <laughs> for joining us, Stephen. No, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm looking forward to, to talking to everyone. We know, Stephen, um, the, the the folks who who tune in every Thursday uh, have a deep interest in history, and of course, one of the one of the wonderful things uh, we we cover so many topics. This is probably one that will be new to many people. Do you want to give people a sense of what it was like at the time, and and kind of the level of awareness there sure. was? Sure, sure. Well, effectively, this was um, the, the Pisces Three um, disaster was in, in 1973 an event that gripped the world, um, and we so we have to take everyone back to 1973, and um, this was a time when um, the the new the, the cable that was being laid um, between Canada and America was it was a new kind of telephone cable, and to give you an in, in, insight into the, the cutting edge technology at the time. This cable allowed 1,750 telephone calls to be made at any point between America, Canada, and the UK. Just think of that, 1,700 people at any one point making a transatlantic phone call. Um, and that was the cutting edge technology at the time. So this was, this was a, the, a very, the analog age effectively. Um, but it was an age where, where news traveled fast. And the, the story of, of these two men Roger Chapman and Roger Mallinson in a very small submarine stuck um, 1,700 feet at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean was a story that gripped the world for three or four days in the late summer and early early autumn of 1973. So it was, in, in a year that had so many big events at the, t at the time, it was an event that, that gripped the world, These the, the plight of these two men. And I imagine it was something where there was uh, almost a countdown, uh, thinking about uh, remaining oxygen. How much? How uh, long might be pulled out? Uh, absolutely. Um, the, the way I sort of um, explain the story to people is um, try and imagine that you're uh, you and your close friend are in a telephone box, and that telephone box is sitting beside the Empire State Building, and then you look out the window and you see the Atlantic Ocean roll towards you uh, and settle at a height. 10 stories above the very top of the Empire State Building, then turn out all the lights, then start draining off your oxygen, 
and then know that, that a rescue, even if it is possible, and now you are at a deeper depth than any other submarine rescue before, um, is two days away at the very, big, the very minimum, and you've got oxygen that can maybe last two and a half, three days. Um, so it was in incredibly tense, and that's what effectively was. It was a countdown. Um, they, they sank um, on the Wednesday, and the perception was that it could maybe have last until um, lunchtime, the early hours of lunchtime on the Saturday. Um, so it was, it was the kind of the, the deadline was 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 true in, in, in the sense of the word. Did on that point for just a minute, was there any way to know for sure how much oxygen was there? And then to kind of be able to forecast and so forth. Yeah, well, that was the point. Is that the 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 way they kind of calculated it was that they had what, what was perceived was if they were in, in active, if they were moving around in the submarine, if they were chatting away freely, if they were just acting as if everything was fine, the perception was that they could have maybe 30, 35 hours of oxygen, but under emergency conditions, when what you would be doing is you would be lying very still. You would be making minimum amount of movement, and you would be keeping communications to the absolute minimum. The perception was that they could stretch that to maybe sort of you know 60, 70 hours. Um, so they, they 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 had a calculation. They could follow it by using by the oxygen tanks they had in there. Um, but it was it was um, rough, and it also was about what they could do to extend it. Well, let's go back then. Talk to us about. Um, actually, let's go back to kind of the early days um, you, your, through your research and so forth can give us an understanding of, of submarines, the invention of submarines, and then this particular submarine and the task that they were doing. Yeah, well, well I mean, the, the, the book covers um, you know, from the, the invention of the submarine, you know, um, all the way through to, to, to the invention of, of the Pisces three craft, which was created in, in Canada. So, I mean, the early days of the, the submarine, what's, what's fascinating about the submarine was that um, Alexander the Great was obsessed with the idea of submarines. So you know, he was lowered um, in a barrel over, over a ship. The idea was to get down into the depths. People were, were obsessed by it. Um, one of the early pioneers of it um, was Leonardo da Vinci, you know, the great, the great artist and inventor. And he, he created drawings of, um, of, of submarines, but, and he created this, these designs for the, the, the Doge of Venice. But his, his perception was that, that man would inherently turn something as wondrous as, as a submarine and ability to go among the deep. He, they would turn it into a weapon of war. So although he drew designs of it, he never actually used it. Um, and what's what's interesting about the, there's, there's a great number of, kind of submarine historians and they're very skeptical of, of, of the early stories of submarines um, because generally if someone was very boastful about their submarine, if they talked about um, why it was a great success and how deep they would go, but if they lived to tell the tale, the perception was that it was probably erroneous. It, it probably didn't happen um, because what you did have was that the, the people who, who, who did pioneer it invariably died. Um, so there was a guy called John Day um, who discovered that um, a barrel um, would hold oxygen. So his idea was he did it with, it with one barrel and went to a relative depth in, in, um, in England. But then what he did was he effectively uh, made a bet and said, look, I'll build a, a, a vessel that can go deep. And he teamed up with a gambler and said, you take bets on it and I, that I will submerge to a depth of 100 feet. I'll then come to the surface. We'll make a clean, you know, we'll, we'll clean up. So this was all organized. There was people all gathering out. There was a, a, a boat that was, that was set up for people to inspect it. And effectively what happened was he, he loaded himself up on this kind of boat that he was able to sink down. And his idea was that he would lie in a hammock and he would sort of, you know, eat ship's biscuits, and then in 12 hours' time, he would rise back to the surface. Problem was, he gets down to the bottom. What he doesn't perceive is the weight of water. So he goes too deep, and the idea is that the, the, the wooden um, skin of, the, of, of this very rudimentary submarine um, bursts through, uh, and he drowns. So he was a pioneer, but one of the, one of the ones that were, that were unsuccessful. Um, and then, I mean, you all the way through, you had... Um, the 18th century was the great time for, for developing submarines. Um, you had during the during sorry prior to that in the American Civil War, Washington um, spent a lot of time developing the kind of idea. There was a submarine called the Turtle that he had great faith in, but again, 
um, the perception was that it was designed and people worked on it, but whether it whether it actually went to any depth and was able to move forward um, was was doubtful. Then during the American Civil War, um, there was successful submarines developed. Um, the Alligator was was one of the ones developed at the time, but the the the, the father of the modern um, submarines we know it was a man called Holland, who was an, an Irishman, effectively. He came over to America, and he, his great device was to, was to pair the, the electric motor, effectively, the diesel engine, with, uh, with, with submarines. And that was, he, he developed it in America, brought it back to, to Britain, and that's what, what effectively was, was created um, at the tail end of the 19th century. And then we saw it develop to, to great effect in, in Germany with the, with the U-boats. So what we had there was the, the submarine as we knew it. Um, and the submarine that the, the, the two men, Roger Mallinson and Roger Chapman, were in was developed in Canada by, um, by three. They were known as the T-shirt boys, uh, and they were led by a guy called Al Trice. And these were guys in the early 60s who were, who were pioneer divers, salvage divers. Um, wearing hard hats with kind of oxygen pipes that were piped down to them. And it was during a, a particularly dangerous dive where they were going to depths of maybe three, over 300, 350 feet. And in order to, to, to do that, you go down for a very short period of time. And you do bounce dives where you're down on the bottom for a very short period of time, then go back up. And they decided, look, there's no, there's no commercial, small, manipulative submarine. Let's invent it ourselves. So they spent um, a lot of money and um, did pioneering work developing what became the Pisces craft. And what's great about it was that when they decided to test it, they tested it in Vancouver and the sounds out there. But with luck or with bad luck, they were testing it in an area where the, the US uh, Navy were testing submarine uh, torpedoes. And it's a great testament to the, to, it's a testament to the, both the success of the Pisces submarine and um, a lack of, of credit to the Americans that they were able to test the submarine while these torpedoes were flying around and um, it, it didn't destroy them. They managed to get to the surface. Um, so, yeah, the, in the Pisces, if I, excuse me a second. The Pisces was a very small two man submarine um, which could go to sort of maybe. Two, two and a half thousand feet down had a, had a manipulator arm um, and was if initially it was used by navies to retrieve um, torpedoes when they were doing testing then um, what happened was during the, um, during the 1970s there was a the great oil boom in, um, in the North Sea and the idea was that submarines would be used for, for, for this kind of vessel or for the, this kind of work um, but at the time of the accident, um, the Pisces submarine was used by Vickers Oceanic. Now, Vickers um, was a subdivision of Vickers Engineering and Vickers Shipbuilding, who, who were kind of legion, who were, who were um, a leviathan of a company in America, sorry, in Britain. And they developed the Polaris submarines for the, 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 the UK Navy. But they'd hired um, or bought over um, the Pisces craft um, and we're using it at the time to to bury the cable. There was a telephone cable, as I explained, that ran from Canada to uh, the UK. And what the job, the cable had been laid, but what they were doing was effectively digging a small trench and allowing the trench to be to, to be covered over effectively, so that it would be uh, it would be protected from uh, from fishermen at the time. Um, and so that, so that, that's the kind of the, the background to the to, to the submarine and to, to, to what they were up to in, in, in the scene at the time. Well, your, your explanation earlier of being in a phone booth and so forth creates quite a visual. Uh, when you said it's a small submarine, give us an idea of... of well, it's maybe, it's, it's maybe kind of, you know, like, you know, um, five feet across, um, you know, five and a half, six feet. So it's, 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 it, there's, there's not a lot of room in there. Um, there's three windows. Um, with, with little portholes that you can effectively see, and and the when they were op operating the manipulator arm, um, you would lie down on a bench. So effectively, you would you, the two of them would be kind of lying down on benches, one steering and the other one operating the manipulator arm. But they could sit up too, 
and um, they had uh, they had a tape recorder down there, and um, this was 1973. So although there was the great albums of the day, um, like Pink Floyd um, and um, you know the great bands who were around at the time. Roger Mallinson was a great fan of of of, uh, of classical music and organ music in particular, and he always insisted that the, the 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 shape of the sphere of the submarine allowed it to have wonderful acoustics, and um, and that was what he was listening to at the time. So yeah, it was it was a, a small space. Uh, it, yes, indeed. Well, so so this was a mission that had been going on for some time, or this type of mission had been done. Uh, for some time, is that correct? In, in yeah, terms of yeah, yeah. What they were doing is they they've been out there for a couple of weeks um, with with different sub crews. So what happened was on the surface was a ship called um, the Vickers Voyager, which was a, a sort of large converted um, sort of fishing trawler, effectively, um, and that was the mothership from which the Pisces was was lowered over and then sort of you know lowered down into the the Atlantic. And then it would be it would be towed out to the spot where they were working, um, and what they would do is they would leave a pinger, which was like a kind of a sonic acoustic, you know, um, baton effectively, that would be left down on the cable where they wanted to go. So whoever it was like a relay race effectively, submarines would go down, they would dig a trench for as long as they could, drop the cable into the trench, and then leave a a pinger um, by the cable then rise back to the surface and they would do eight to 10 hour shifts. So Roger Mallinson and Roger Chapman um, were doing their, their shift um, on, on the Wednesday and the very early hours of the Wednesday morning. So it was, I think it was, it was like two in the morning when they when they, they submerged down to do their shift effectively. They had their sandwiches, they had their flask of coffee um, and there's their emergency rations of ship biscuits and that was it. So they, they effectively um, dropped down to 1,700 feet, found the cable, and then spent eight hours um, using a kind of um, a, a water hose to, to blow away the sand to create this trench and to drop the cables in. Then after they'd done the shift, they rose back up to the surface. And it was when they got to the surface that everything went wrong. Effectively, it was a, a freak accident because what happened was when they got to the surface, um, the divers came out in a small skiff and a rope that they were using to tow them back in looped around um, a bolt that was on the aft shaft, sorry, the aft sphere at the back of the submarine. This was another sphere of buoyancy that, um, that, that was obviously part of the submarine, but it wasn't connected, so the, it was kind of sealed. Um, but what happened was the rope um, untied the screw and the, the the lid effectively flipped open and water rushed into the, the back of the sphere, obviously tipping it over in terms of buoyancy, and it dragged it down sort of butt first effectively. So what you had, had was the, the submarine flipped backwards and began to sink, and it sank um, to 100, about 150 feet, and then it was caught on the tow rope. Now, obviously, the tow rope was not designed to sustain the weight of a submarine underwater. So that lasted as long as it could. And inside the submarine, you had Roger Chapman and Roger Mallinson. It was Roger Mallinson who was um, attempting to unscrew a, a large weight. There was a large weight effectively at the bottom of the submarine that allowed them to take off from the surface as they became trapped. So he was trying to take off that, that weight. And what happened was he managed to get it off just at the same time as the rope snapped. The rope snapped and they effectively crashed down uh, at speeds onto the bottom. And Roger Mallinson talked about the sound being like a Stuker dive bomber um, with the kind of the, the engines, the, the water driven through the kind of engines and the noise. Um, and when they were getting close to the bottom, uh, they were so fearful of the, the impact of the crash that Mallinson shouted to Chapman and threw him a rag and said, put the rag in your mouth in case you, you know, we, we effectively bite through our tongues when we hit the surface, so when they, we hit the bottom. Um, of the Atlantic Ocean, and then the, the crash landed in, in complete darkness. Um, give us a, a little bit of a sense of their the the background of these two men. Well, you um, Roger Chapman um, was ex Navy, so he had worked on, on nuclear submarines for a number of years until he became he he 
had trouble with his, well, not trouble with his eyesight, but his, his eyesight wasn't deemed good enough to, to remain in the Navy. And he decided to leave. So he was he was naval trained. Um, Roger Mallinson was, was, was a great engineer. He was a man who was just obsessed with, with, with fixing things and had worked for a number of different companies and then joined, um, he was slightly older, he was 33 at the time. And he had um, joined Vickers Oceanic at a time when he'd, he'd never been in a submarine before, but very few people had, it was a, it was a pioneering industry. So that was the kind of background to them. Uh, they were both married. Um, Roger Chapman uh, had got married about a year or so, two years before, didn't have any kids, and Roger Mallinson um, had, had three kids at the time. So they, yeah, there was, that was the kind of background to them and the, the kind of position they're in at the time. And, and so no doubt contributing to uh, the drama. Yeah, uh, yeah. The event, right? The, the, the family waiting to hear and so forth. Uh, so so they, they, they descend to the bottom and is it is it the, the violent crash that they're fearing? Well, yeah, the idea was that it was an uncontrolled descent. They were just plummeting on the, on the way to the submarine. So they, they, they hit the bottom um, and they're in complete darkness. And the first thing they do is that they, they have to turn on um, the lights because there's, there's electric there's batteries that are effectively operating down there so so that they have lights but more than anything the the battery has to um, the battery powers they have there has to operate the scrubber and the scrubber was a kind of electric device that effectively processed the the air if you're in a submarine um you've got two things to worry about one is the amount of oxygen that, that you have in there the second thing is the amount of carbon dioxide because if you one, I mean, one will both will kill you effectively if, if you run out of oxygen. But if there's a buildup of carbon dioxide, that will kill you as well. So the scrubber was effectively um, a device that, that sucked in the air through a chemical that processed the the, the the air and took out the carbon dioxide. But that that had to be done um, using a, a, a battery. And the first thing they did was that they they had three different types of battery working up to sort of 120 volts. And their fear was that A, the batteries wouldn't be working, but also that the battery could be damaged and that that would result in a fire inside the submarine. Now, a few years before, there'd been a terrible disaster with the, the, the Apollo mission um, where the, the astronauts had, there'd been a fire inside the capsule. Um, and that was obviously in their mind when they're turning on these batteries. But thankfully, the batteries come on, the light comes on, and the scrubber begins to operate. So they know um, within the first 10, 15 minutes that they've got a fighting chance to live. So, so talk to us about what happens from there. At what point do folks at the surface realize there's a problem? Is it is it immediately because they yeah, saw it? Yeah, it's, it's, it, on the surface, it's immediate because they, they see them sink. And um, now the other thing, the other problem they have is that they don't know where they are exactly, because what they did was, um, it, as I said, it was a, this was an analog age. So there was, the way that they would they would keep tracks on the submarine was that, kind of like Jaws, that great scene in Jaws where they fire a barrel into the shark and they follow the barrel along the, the ocean, the, the, the top of the ocean, the, the waves. Um, there was a buoy, a kind of colored buoy that was attached to a 2000 foot length of rope and the rope was attached to the submarine. So what would happen is the submarine would come to the surface, um, but the first thing the diver would do on the surface would, was disconnect this cable. And the, and that's what, what happened. They disconnected the cable before uh, the submarine um, sank. So although they, they knew roughly the spot and the ocean where it sank, they didn't know where it landed. Um, so what they did was the Vickers Oceanics, um, the, time, or the, the Voyager, the, the, the ship on the surface, contacted the base back in Barrow and Furness. Um, the team at Barrow and Furness was led by a man called Peter Maserbury, um, who ironically had been stuck in the exact same submarine at a depth of 600 feet um, in Vancouver when he was over there learning about the submarines. So he knew exactly what they were like. And although he was ex-Navy and had been a diver, trained diver, decorated diver, um, he knew how terrifying it was to be in that situation. So they put a, they basically put a, a massive rescue operation into into uh, they, they got they got it going, and that involved 
three things. It involved alerting the Royal Navy. So Subsmash was alerted, which was um, any vessel in the area that a submarine was down and as much aid was to be given as possible. That was the first thing. The second thing was they contacted um, the Canadian team because effectively there was two submarines. There was a submarine operating off the coast of Ireland and then there was a submarine operating off the coast of Canada that was doing the same job, um, digging um, trenches for the cables. So that was the, the, the other Pisces craft that was alerted and the foot sprang into action or the Canadians loaded up the, the, the Pisces craft, contacted the Canadian uh, military. A uh, Hercules aircraft was organized, was gassed and, and on the runway for by the time they got the, the Pisces craft to the, to the runway and then they took off. Um, and then the next part of the jigsaw was um, the Americans so in America, there was um, over in San Diego, that was the kind of great base for, for submarine rescue, for submarine operations in, um, in America at the time. And they had what was known as Curve, which was, um, again, high technology. It was a remote controlled or a tethered controlled um, submarine, uh, which was, they used to describe it as like a kind of faithful dog on a leash. Um, although it wasn't piloted by a man sitting in a submarine, it was piloted by a man sitting on the surface um, with, with a very rudimentary computer game. Um, it was very successful in that it had, it had been used a number of years before um, to track down an atom bomb which had uh, sunk off the coast of Spain. There had been a, a crash, a mid-air crash, which resulted in one of the, the, the A-bombs landing um, off the coast of Spain and Curve had been used to track it down and to get it to the surface. So the, the Americans um, were in operation, they loaded up curve, um, American Air Forces were, were brought in to, to get their planes ready, they loaded them up. So within maybe, I think it's maybe within 20 hours, you had these two planes, one taking off from um, Canada, uh, east coast of Canada, the other one from west coast of America, and they're flying to Cork, um, which is where um, um, the ship uh, Vickers Voyager is going to is heading back to because, and there's also a, another submarine coming in from the North Sea that had been used so th the rescue operation was very much belt and braces it was all about um, how do we throw as much resources as possible at this rescue um, in an attempt to get them up so um, after uh, a number of hours maybe after 12 hours um, the ship on the surface had to leave them and sail from the, the, the spot, which is 120 miles, 150 miles off the coast of Ireland. Um, then it would, that sailed back to, 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 um, to Cork in order to get all these different pieces of the jigsaw puzzle on board and then sail back out. Now, this was the, the deepest rescue ever attempted. Yeah, Is it was 1,700 correct? feet. And, and Previously, what was the what was the what well? It's normally, normally, normally these kind of rescues take place at at, at two, three, four hundred feet. You know, I mean, it's um, there is very rare. I mean, the the previous one was six six hundred feet with it with the Pisces one, but most cases um, where where the rescue suffers, um, it's it's in a few hundred feet of water. I mean, so what happened then was that the the Voyager with these two other small miniature submarines gets back on the scene. The Americans, because they were flying from the West Coast, came later and they were picked up by the, the, the uh, another kind of um, craft, the John Cabot, uh, which was a kind of Canadian icebreaker. And that took them out from Cork to the scene. And it was in the early hours of the Friday morning that um, the vessel gets back there. So they're already through a 40 hours worth of oxygen. And that's when the rescue started. And again, there's a great line, which is, um, how do you make God laugh? And it's tell him your plans. Yeah. Um, because Peter Maservery's attitude was that once they were on the surface, they would send down a miniature submarine with a long rope and a cable effectively to the bottom, you know, down to, to where they were. They would attach it to the submarine, and then they would winch it to the surface. His, his idea was that it would take, you know, we could once they got there, they could do it in four or five hours. And that was not how it went. 
um, to sort of talk you through all the things that went wrong. Um, they get to the surface, so they get to the point, um, and now bear in mind, they still don't know exactly where it is, so they launch the first rescue craft. Well, first things first is trying to get out to the spot is problematic because all the outboard motors don't work for some reason. They eventually have to have another outboard motor sent over um, to sort of pilot, pilot the, the, the little boat that takes them out to the spot. So that's the first thing that goes wrong. Second thing that goes wrong is that the first Pisces miniature submarine goes down carrying a rope and they miscalculate the buoyancy of the rope. So they get to about 1,200 feet and the buoyancy of the rope is so strong that they're dragging this 1,200 foot, foot of rope that it pulls out of the arm of the the claw in the front of the, the submarine, the manipulator arm. Not only does it, so that disappears, suddenly they don't have the rope because it's pulled out, but it's also the strength the, 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 with which it was pulled out uh, bends the manipulator arm. So they have a submarine on their first attempt that has an, that doesn't have a rope and the manipulator arm is broken. So it goes down to the bottom anyway, spends some time, a couple of hours trying to find them, is unsuccessful, goes back to the surface. So that's the first um, rescue submarine. It's the Canadians' turn now. The Canadians go down in a, another sister uh, Pisces vessel. They go down to the bottom. They get to the bottom. They spend eight hours trying to find Pisces um, three. They can't find them. So you, if you imagine a landscape of like a desert landscape with that's in pitch darkness, that's what they're operating in. They know that um, they know effectively that there's a uh, and a, a, a haystack, but they just don't know where the needle is. So they're down at the bottom. Uh, they're using sonar to try and find it, but they're down there for eight hours, no luck. They go back to the surface, they move to a different part, they go back down again. That's when they ask Roger Mallinson, sorry, Roger Chapman, to sing. The idea is that if he's singing, he's hitting different notes, there's, no, there's more noise going on, um, they might be able to pick it up that way. Um, and effectively, the, 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 it's a combination of, of Mallinson singing. Um, I'll, I'll, first of all, they, they have to ask him to count to 50, which is obviously using up oxygen, but they need to do that. Um, and eventually, um, after more and more hours, they finally catch on to them. They finally recognise where they are on the sonar. And there's a beautiful scene where Chapman and Mallinson are looking at the portholes, and they're obviously just looking at pitch darkness with occasional fish floating past. And then suddenly the scene outside their porthole window begins to lighten and lighten. And that's when they realise that it's the beam from their sister submarine has got to them. And that's when they decide to, to celebrate by cracking open their, their bottle of their, their can of lemonade. Because the, the, they're not prepared down there. They don't have water, which is incredible when you look back on it. They've got a can of, of lemonade. They've got a flask of cold coffee and they've got some ship's biscuits. But for most of the time, to, in order to kind of um, hydrate themselves, they're, they're, they're taking water um, that's built up from their kind of, um, from, from breathing effectively, moisture from the inside of the, of the vessel. And they're kind of dabbing that in their tongues to try and keep themselves hydrated. So when the submarine uh, finally finds them, they celebrate with a can of, of, of lemonade because um, they think they're rescued. They're being found, but they've not yet been rescued. Because that's when the next thing goes wrong. The Canadian um, come over and effectively try and lock on to um, to the submarine with a with a with a hook. And uh, as I've described it in the book, it's effectively like um, threading a needle wearing a suit of armor, because um, you're you're effectively trying to manipulate it on. And what happens is eventually they do it. They manage to lock it on to the the the, surf, the the top of the the submarine where there's a special um, hole designed for bearing the weight of it, and they manage to lock it on, so they're delighted. But then again, how do you make God laugh? Tell me your plans. That hook, just in a freak fluke, swivels out. So no sooner has it locked on than it falls free, and they're looking at the portal. That it, it, what what effectively is like a balloon um, cast in a breeze as this rope is just drifting away from them. And they, they're pursuing it incredibly slowly, like two arthritic pensioners trying to catch hold of this rope. And they catch hold of it, 
but they can only get it onto the grill that surrounds the propeller, which won't bear the weight. So again, they've got a rope, they know what it is now, and they've got a rope on it, but the rope is in a position that won't bear the weight. And the battery on the other sub submarine is 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 being is, is running out. So that's the next thing. They've they've they found it, they have a rope attached, but it's not a, a, a attached to a strong enough place on it. And then what happens over the next 24 hours is a series of other missions to go down um, to, to, to get it. And to give you an indication of the, of the level of, ex of exhaustion they're at, back in Barrow and Furness, you have their colleagues who are communicating with them through, through radio. And again, it's not like today where you were on the phone, you know, we would phone each other and we would show FaceTime and it would just be like me talking to you, you know, um, 5,000 miles away. What they're getting is static, crickly conversations where they can sometimes hear, they can not hear. But um, the team in Barrow and Furness hear that the, the, the guys in the ship are getting really tired and exhausted. So what they decide to do is they put together another team um, that flies out on the Friday night. They, pick, they fly out in a, helicopter, sorry, in a plane from Barrow and Furness to Cork. They're picked up by a Royal Navy Sea King helicopter. Problem is it's stormy in the Atlantic now. So these are guys who've, who've never been in a helicopter. They're flown out in the evening in a storm and the, helico the Sea King helicopter manages to find Voyager, but it's in the middle of a storm and he then has to lower them down onto the deck of Voyager. Um, so the problem is that the Voyager's going up and down and up and down. So as soon as they get lowered down onto the surface, um, the, 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 the deck falls away from them. So it's a massive operation to, to get them onto the, onto the ship. Um, and when they do get onto the ship, um, this new team comes on board and effectively it helps supercharge it. They are fresh, they're enthusiastic. They're all enthusiastic. They want to save their men. What they're able to do is is fix one of the submarines um, and also uh, one of the guys goes down um, in the early hours of the Saturday morning and he gets the first rope onto it. Um, in fact, I must, because it, this, that's the thing with, with these things, there's so many there's so many names that I, I keep forgetting who the, the, the main character is. Ted Carter. Ted Carter is the man who um, who decided to, to get them out there on the helicopter. And it was Ted who goes down with Des Darcy, um, who is on his third frustrated dive. And they managed to get the first rope on board. Now, again, it's complicated because the Americans have arrived on the scene. The Americans arrived to the rescue on the Friday night because um, they are 12 hours behind and everything, everyone's exhausted and they say, well, we're going to launch Curve curve to the rescue. The problem is, again, almost in a, a bad scene in a movie, um, they are they power up uh, Curve, but what they don't know is that all the salt water and sea space come on board and that has uh, effectively got into all, the, into all the, the electronics. So as soon as they power it up, it blows the whole thing blows. So there's nothing they can do about it. Time, every second counts. And they have to phone uh, Peter Maservery and say, yeah, it's blown. And he says, how long is it going to take? And they say four hours. To rewire, everything is going to take about four hours. And he keeps phoning back every half an hour and they keep saying it's going to take four hours. No matter how many times you phone, it's going to take four hours. So what happens is, um, um, they've managed to get one rope on, um, but they need a second rope. And Curve is finally launched at about, eight, I think it's about seven or eight in the morning, uh, on a Saturday morning when they're really close to the wire. Um, and it, everything, everything that's gone wrong, this is the bit that goes smoothest. Um, Larry Brady, um, who sadly passed just a few weeks ago, um, pilots Curve down to 1,700 feet. They know exactly where the submarine is, and he's able to drop in a, a toggle, um, like an up, uh, like a T-bar, effectively, into the aft sphere. And as he said, it went so smoothly. He, he describes it as um, parking the car after a very long drive. 
Imagine parking the car after you've driven across America. Um, the journey is the hard part. Parking the car is the easy part. And that's what he manages to do. And then the irony is they've got two ropes onto them. They're going to be rescued. And But for Chapman and Mallinson, this is the worst part of the entire ordeal, which people can't actually believe when they say it wasn't the three days where you were stuck under the water. It wasn't kind of having to defecate in a bag and put it away in a tin. You know, it wasn't kind of being so parched. They'll say, no, the worst part was being taken from 1,700 feet on the seabed to the surface because it took over two hours, two and a half hours it took. And also because of the 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 ship that they were taken from, it was, it was stormy, so the ship was going up and down, up and down. And you try and imagine that they were like a fish in a hook. The, the submarine was constantly flipping back and forth and back and forth, and they were being smashed about inside the submarine. And yeah, it, it, for them, that was the worst part of the ordeal. And even then it wasn't over because they got to 100 feet from the surface and it stops because they need yet another rope attached. And one of the divers goes down and he describes it as like trying to land in a bucking bronco and he gets the final rope on. And um, well, you'll have to, all the viewers are, and uh, will have to buy a copy of the book to find out what happens next. But let's just say it's a happy ending. Well, that is, that is uh, uh, really interesting. And it's easy to imagine the, uh, the tension really around the world. Uh, uh, it was, uh, you know, as, as people were watching this race against time, not knowing what was going to, you know, how it was going to, how it was going to play out. Um, yeah. Fascinating. Well, I, I have one more question, and then we'll we'll go to uh, qu questions that we have from uh, from viewers. Um, you have written a uh, a, a wide variety on a wide wide variety of topics. How did this one? get on your radar screen and, and what made you uh, decide to commit so much, so, yeah. long, so much research to this? Well, it was, I first heard about it um, on a cruise ship off the Aeolian Islands about seven or eight years ago. And it was the, the captain of the ship um, had talked about this, this event and I had never heard about it before. Um, and I kind of filed it away. Um, and then a couple of years ago, I was looking for a new subject for a book. And I kept thinking, I'd, I'd heard about it and realized that although Roger Chapman, um, who survived, wrote his own memoir about the book, um, th there hadn't been a, a book by someone who wasn't directly involved. I, there was only that one book that came out a couple of years after the event, so 35 years ago. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to tell the story of all those rescuers, all those um, links in the chain, this brotherhood of the sea, um, that came together and put everything aside and did put all the resources they had, had they, they had together to get them to the surface. And what I liked about it was, one was that element, Canada, America, Britain, all pulling together at a time when they've all, you know, um, Britain's, it's 1973, so um, Britain's is in financial kind of crisis. America's just coming out of the, the Vietnam War. You know, Canada is, is pioneering this new technology. I just thought it, there was good material there. Um, but also, um, it was a natural non-fiction thriller because time is the enemy here. Um, time is this remorseless, the remorseless ticking clock. People talk about a ticking clock event and documentaries, we talk about what's the ticking clock element. This was a ticking clock. You know, you, you've only got a certain amount of oxygen and it's running out. Um, and it was those kind of elements that made me think that there's there's, there's potentially a um, there's a I knew there was a great story there. Um, it was just a case of, of whether I, I could I could write a great book out of it, and I, and I hope I have. Well, I understand that you have uh, because uh, Carrie's had an opportunity to read the book and uh, raved about it. And Carrie, do we oh, have thank you. Uh, do we have questions? We do. Uh, you had mentioned that this was something that caught the world's attention and they're waiting for this. So they're out in the middle of the ocean. How did the press cover this? Well, that was the thing. The press um, press are, 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 are very dedicated. The press um, went to Cork and then they hired um, fishing vessels um, at Cork and then the, the fishing vessels, it was great for them. You know, they, they went out onto the scene. In fact, it was that t tension between the journalists trying to do their job and the rescue because 
what happened was that the, the, the actual um, Bob Easter, who was the captain of, of, of the Voyager, of the ship, he complained about the press because he he felt that there was too, they were making too, their engines were making too much noise um, and they were interfering with communications. They were also trying to get too close to the situation. So he persuaded the, the Navy to um, use a giant chalkboard with back off and which they flew around all the different vessels um, asking the press to back off. Um, but of course, press, you know, they, they, they have a job to do, so they stayed, they stayed put. Um, but, but they did have a difficult job. One of the journalists um, was doing a live um, radio um, broadcast back home with Terry Wogan, who was a kind of iconic figure. Um, the Terry Wogan Breakfast Show, which was, was the big show in, in, um, in Britain at the time. And he threw up um, during the live show because it was the, the sea was so violent. So the, the press were, were out there, but they didn't find it easy. And there was also um, like two or three press conferences a day uh, at Barrow and Furness updating everyone on what was going on. So, um, it, yeah, it was. But and what was interesting was to, to go back and look at the actual newspaper coverage um, was that so confident were they in saying that the flotilla is going out there um, they're, they're going to plan the rescue that a lot of the coverage hedged the bet so it would say that they were expected to be rescued by the time the readers picked up the paper in the morning. And of course, that wasn't the case. I mean, they didn't say they had been rescued, but it was that the feeling was that readers would be reading this in the morning but they would already be hearing about them being rescued on the radio um, and that wasn't that it was it, it was very 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 close all right thank you um how many of the men rescued and rescuers are still alive and were you able to interview them <laughs> yes i was i was very fortunate of the men there's roger chapman and roger mallinson were the two men in the submarine and um sadly roger chapman died uh, sort of, um, a year and a half ago, I wasn't able to, to, to speak to him, but I spoke to his wife, June Chapman, um, and they were very, the family was very supportive of the book. Roger Mallinson um, is still alive, and I interviewed Roger um, extensively, um, all over the phone because of, of, um, of the pandemic, um, but he's an amazing character and is, is very supportive of the, of, of the book. And the rescuers, I was able to speak to Al Trice, is, is, I think he's 92 now. Um, Al Trice was the man who designed Pisces, um, the, the um, submarine, and he was also in the UK at the time of the accident. So he, although the Canadians flew over, he was actually in the UK, um, but he missed the, he was late getting over to Cork. So they flew him out in a helicopter and then dropped him down um, onto on, on board the ship. Um, so I interviewed Al and Mike McDonald, who was one of the pilots, um, and Larry Brady. Um, and the, you know the, a number of the American teams. So I was very fortunate in being able to speak to a number of the guys. The guy who designed the toggle, um, I was able to, to to speak to him. So there was that. There was a number of them that were that, that are all listed in the book, and um, that I was able to speak to. So I was very fortunate in that respect to get um, first-hand accounts of, of what happened and pair that up with the with the official. There was an official report that was written after the event, but these things can be often be quite dry. So it's great to get people's specific memories of it, of the event. Definitely. All right. Well, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. And we do have a link to Stephen's book in the chat. And check that out. Pick up a copy. It, it really is a good read. You'll read right through it quickly. And I sort of felt like this was Apollo 13 under the sea. So <laughs> you saw a lot of <laughs> So check that out. Uh, next week, we are speaking with Elizabeth Cobbs, and she will be joining us to talk about the Hello Girls, America's first women soldiers. They were telephone switchboard operators during World War I, and they were not recognized as soldiers officially until the late 1970s. So we've got a great story there, and we hope that you will join us. Thank you, Stephen, for joining us tonight, and thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you for having me. Good night.